good to have everybody here. I'm going to jump right into it, get started with our guest who is none other than the CTO and co-founder of Tekton AI, which has quite a bit of hype these days because the majority of the team comes from some hard hitters. They've got people like our host himself, who was an ex-Uber, ex-Michelangelo. We've also got some ex-Facebook, ex-Quora guys, ex-Twitter. You name it as far as where you spend your time on the internet, they probably have someone that used to work there. So that is what's going on with Tekton. And for our guest, he is not only a machine when it comes to coding and creating MLOps tools, but he also does some ultra endurance sports. So he told me he did, did a little bit of Ironman. He's done some ultra marathons, but his favorite, his, the most fun he's had was when he ran 250 kilometers across the Sahara Desert, which is mind blowing. <laughs> I think for all you that are from the U.S. and don't know kilometers, that's around like 150 miles. So you get an idea. Uh, I can imagine you're drinking a lot of water. Did you go Wim Hof style? <laughs> so yeah, please give it up. A uh, big round of applause for our guest. We have Kevin Stump, the CTO of Tekton. Thank you for coming on here, Kevin. I really appreciate you joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so before we jump into anything about Tekton and feature stores, I know that's kind of what we're going to be centered around today. And we're talking about a lot of feature stores and what you all are doing at Tekton around feature stores. I wanted to just start with a question that I normally start with, which is how did you end up in the place that you're at now? I know you're originally from Germany and now you're living in the Bay Area you were working at Uber. Can you give us a bit of a story around that and how it all happened? Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, but I've always been a software engineer. And as you mentioned, I'm from Europe, from Germany specifically. And after high school, I uh, started a software development company that built software for various companies all over Europe and the US, including things like uh, testbed automation software for GM in Michigan. And uh, through that engagement and project, I got to really like the U.S. and decided to come over, come over to the Bay Area and stop focusing on just uh, service-oriented software businesses and really focus on product-oriented businesses. And through that thought, it would be a good idea to um, layer on some, some business education too. And I went to um, Stanford's business school and through that ended up co-founding Dispatcher, which was an end-to-end um, -end marketplace that connected long-haul truck drivers to uh, shippers and was really the Uber for long-haul truck driving. Um, that's then also how we ended up at Uber because Uber was building out its own internal Uber freight division. And then as soon as I joined Uber, I switched over to Michelangelo, the ML platform team, and then worked there as an engineering manager and tech lead off the platform. And saw all the potential and all the, the impact that Michelangelo and then centralized and that standardized ML platform had at Uber, which you can really think about it as leading to this Cambrian explosion of machine learning applications within Uber, just by providing this centralized standardized platform that all the engineers and all the data scientists were able to use to get ML real into production so that had massive impact at the company at Uber. And um, that's why we decided, hey, let's, uh, let's start a company around in this space um, so they, that we can provide similar tooling, similar platforms to other enterprises that are not necessarily only in the Bay Area. Yeah, so were you bought by Uber? And what year was that? That was in 2016 is when we joined them. And it was... Uh, yeah, our entire company joined them and our entire operations and sales and whatnot team, um, or the majority of them then joined that fledgling Uber Freight division at, at Uber at the exact same time they acquired Auto, which was the self-driving trucking company. And then um, 
through that, they then uh, just build out that division within Uber. Perfect. So let's jump into feature stores because I got a lot of questions to ask. And let's do it. I want to just start with what a feature is. And I've, you know, I was reading up a bit on, can you just give us a breakdown of what a feature is, what feature engineering is, that kind of info? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for those so, of us that are, are like me and a little bit slower. You no, know, for sure. It's, it, it's definitely a complicated and interesting and, and new topic. And features is really data for machine learning. And it's typically um, data or information that's derived from raw data in an organization. Uh, you can think about it as being highly curated, really high quality information that ML models are able to detect patterns in. And those features then help the, the model to predict something. Like it helps um, a model to predict which um, restaurant are you most likely to pick from if you open up an Uber Eats app. Or how long is it most likely going to take you to um, get an Uber ride from Palo Alto up to San Francisco. And um, typically the way you get from just raw data to these features, to so this highly curated, high quality information is by either just cleaning the raw data by filtering out outliers um, or by aggregating information where maybe you're saying, hey, how many times has um, a certain customer ordered a Thai dish in the last uh, 30 days? Um, so it's an aggregate feature then that would be very helpful for an ML model to detect patterns in. And then oftentimes it's also human intuition that is applied to raw information where um, you can imagine that maybe a data scientist has the intuition that the weather outside may have something to do with what people want to eat right now in it. So you could have a Boolean variable that says, hey, is it like pretty warm right now outside or is it pretty uh, cold outside right now, which may determine whether somebody is more likely to order like a hot soup or a cold ice cream right now and stuff like that. Oh, that's, that's such a good way of putting it and it makes total sense. So now when it comes to features and this idea of taking the whatever certain parts of, I look at it like uh, you have your Excel sheet, right? And then you take a certain piece of the Excel sheet and maybe you combined it with another one and, or you say, this is the important one. Let's look at it that way. I'm, I know I'm oversimplifying this like crazy, but, um, but that's uh, how, how I'm looking at it. Now, what is it that needs to be done when you're trying to create like a store where you can just look at these and say, all right, um, I want to be able to pull from that quite easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so there are at least three things that you need to do. On the one side, it's like curation of those features. So somehow these features need to be calculated and they need to be ingested into this feature store. So they need to come from somewhere. And again, it's typically like you start with the raw data, which may live in a data lake. It may live in a data warehouse. It may even be on streams like Kafka streams or maybe real-time data. And that needs to be transformed, typically cleaned up, aggregated. And then those feature values need to make it into the feature store itself, like the database, if you will, um, where it can then be retrieved from later on. And then you need to be able to um, serve those feature values, serve them typically to three different types of consumers. One is um, the data scientist who just wants to interactively explore um, features and maybe solve a new modeling problem and pull out historical feature values, larger scale typically, in order to be able to train models, play around and see what works, what doesn't work. The second consumer would typically be production training pipelines that run like on a cron job, nightly, weekly, however frequently, to um, train UML models that also need to then consume from this feature store to fetch the latest set of updated feature values to train a new model. And then third, and uh, most importantly, and, and also the hardest type of consumer, is the actual production model that um, oftentimes has the requirement of serving predictions at very, very low latency and very, very high scale, like an Uber um, Eats um, recommendation model or an Uber ETA prediction model. These types of models, they don't have more than 10, 20 milliseconds to make a prediction. They need to be able to fetch these feature values 
from the feature store in, in really low latency with, uh, with production SLAs. And then layered on top of that, the last piece, of course, is also the management of those features. Like somehow you need to be able to um, be able to discover and search and find new features, identify um, what business entities, business objects are these, and these, business, these features typically associated with, um, who's on the hook for them, can I trust a certain feature, how much does it cost me, am I even allowed to use it, what purpose am I allowed to use it for, and that type of stuff. Hmm. Yeah, and that gets into something that I'll, I want to touch on later on about permission and how that would work out. But before we go into that, there was something I wanted to ask about. When do you feel it's right for a company to start looking at feature stores? And what is it right from the beginning of their ML journey? Is it something that you have to be a bit more mature in order to actually make good use of it? Or is it a little bit of both? Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you're, if you're just one data scientist um, uh, or two playing in uh, Jupyter Notebooks and you're just running very simple offline predictions, um, literally yourself in a notebook, and there is not a whole lot of features that uh, you iterate on or that you even are sharing with the other data scientists, then something like a feature store may be an overkill but typically signals um, to look out for that are a good sign um, that you do need a feature store is, um, are you wasting a lot of time getting um, ML model into production? And are you spending a lot of time there creating, writing new data pipelines that make that feature data available in production for serving for the model? Um, do you struggle with training, serving inconsistencies where features are calculated differently for training purposes versus for serving purposes? If that's the case, that's a problem that, um, that a feature store helps you with. Um, do you find that data scientists are oftentimes reinventing the wheel, implementing the same feature over and over again, maybe even with slightly different understandings of um, what, how a feature should be implemented? Um, if you have features that consume raw data from various different types of data sources. Say you want to combine raw data from a data warehouse and a data lake and a streaming source. That's really hard to get right. You need really um, sophisticated data pipelines to get to do this type of stuff properly. If you face these types of challenges, then typically that feature store is also a pretty good idea for you. Yeah. Let's go into that a bit more. Like why is it really hard to build features? Yeah, um, so the, you can think about it um, this way. Look, going again, looking in again at the raw data sources, um, the data warehouse, the stream, the data lakes, the real-time data sources, they all have very different um, characteristics to them. For one, um, you typically cannot run the exact same type of feature transformation against those different types of data sources. So a data warehouse is really, really good at um, running large scale <clears throat> aggregations and joints. It takes a long time to execute them, but they're really, really good at doing that type of stuff. Whenever you slice and dice and filter out only a small set of columns, you want to aggregate over them and again, join them. That's when a, when a data warehouse or a data lake is very good. Um, if you look at streams, for instance, you cannot do a large scale um, aggregation or large scale join very efficiently with a stream. With a stream, you're really um, limited more to running row based um, or event based transformations where you're combining a couple fields from, from events on a stream. Or you run temporal aggregations over limited time windows because if the time window becomes too large, then of course your stream processor can uh, run out of memory and, and run into all kinds of issues. And then um, if you're looking at more of the OLTP type databases, like the Mongos of the world, the, the uh, MySQLs or Postgres's, they're typically pretty good at running row-based transformations and small scale aggregations, but they don't have the entire historical data, right? They only have typically like the most recent data, maybe over the last six months, maybe over the last year, but they don't have all that historical context in which you can have really important high quality information that may allow the ML model to predict much more accurately what a user is about to do next. And so 
that's a, that's a pretty hard challenge to build a system that is able to run transformations against these different types of data sources that all have various, very, very, very different characteristics. Then, of course, your features also have different freshness requirements. So if you think about um, um, like an Uber Eats model, which is trying to predict how long is it likely going to take uh, for a restaurant to prepare an order for you if you were to place an order right now, there, imagine there are two features that are typically very important here. One is how many orders have been placed in the last 30 minutes, because that's typically a proxy for how busy is the restaurant right now. And another feature will be um, how long does it take on average over the last two weeks for this restaurant to finish an order? Both of those have very different freshness requirements, where you can imagine that the 30 minute um, average or the 30 minute trailing count of orders has to be updated like every minute, every five minutes. If you update it at every hour or so, you're, you're missing on a lot of uh, you know, very relevant information because you just don't know what's actually currently happening in the restaurant. Hmm. The two week feature though, you can just update nightly. It doesn't really matter that much. It doesn't, there's not that much minute to minute variance in this feature that the model could pick up from. Um, and then of course, there's also, again, this problem with online offline consistency, where you find a lot of people just implementing feature transformations differently on the online side, as well as on the offline side. And if you have different implementations for these feature transformations, then all kinds of things can go wrong where oftentimes some edge cases are treated differently or you introduce a bug in one, but not in the other. And then your model picks up on something in the offline world that it will never see in the online world. And then of course your model looks great when you do an offline back test, but it's going to completely fail when you're then later on trying to run it in production. You've got no idea what's going on and then you need to debug the feature transformation code and then you see, oh shit, here I'm handling a null completely different or I'm dealing with a different floating point precision or something like that, that is just really tricky to, to dig into and, and, uh, and figure out. And then another thing that makes these features uh, for operational ML really hard is that typically these types of ML models, when you generate training data, you want to be able to time travel to any point in the past to look at what did the world look like at any given point of time in the past and then fetch a state of, of like hundreds of thousands of features and then you generate a time series over say uh, that you update hourly or daily and then over you could go to like a feature store and say hey give me the value of these 1000 features for every single day in the last 365 days mm -hmm. which then produces 365 rows and it's really hard actually to get this time travel done right um Oh, but so anyways, those are just a couple of those features. Yeah. So I have one request. Can we stop talking about Uber Eats? Because I haven't had dinner yet. And <laughs> <laughs> you're making me hungry. <laughs> uh, so, but let's get into Uber a bit more because I know you did quite a bit of work there and you were messing around on Michelangelo. So what made you gravitate towards that project? And what exactly were you doing on Michelangelo? Um, what uh, gravitated me towards Michelangelo when I was at Uber, you mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was really, um, it was seeing how, on the one side, how much potential there was at Uber to apply machine learning for all kinds of different use cases, because Uber was the fastest growing private company of all times. It was collecting so much data on uh on rides, on what users were doing, on what's, what was happening in the Uber Eats app. And <laughs> there, um, there, was just, <laughs> there was just a lot of um, manual work um, that unnecessarily had to happen that led to suboptimal decisions um, around can you, how... Can you tell us like what some of that manual work was? Yeah, like imagine that there, um, yeah, a, a customer support ticket request is coming in. And now the first step that it has, that this ticket goes through is that some person has to read the ticket, understand what the issue is, and then figure out, okay, what's the urgency of this request? What's the priority of it? Who's, what's the department within Uber that's um, best suited to respond to this customer and then manually route it over. 
that obviously takes forever. It's a really poor experience for the customer because they're waiting forever. The, the person may actually, who's making the routing decision may make a wrong decision. It's hard to track whether it was a good or bad decision. So overall, just not efficient at all and extremely expensive, both to the company and to the customer. And so here, it's an obvious opportunity to apply an ML model that takes care of this routing decision that can actually look at the text, try to understand the, the context, try to predict, hey, what's the priority of this thing? What's actually the issue? And then route it to the right department and treat it with the right level of urgency. And so, so when you were seeing these manual steps having to be done, then Michelangelo came and said, all right, we're going to fix that. Or what, what did you see and how did that work out? Like, what was the fix for that? Yeah, I think so. It was actually like many, many different teams and many different very smart people at Uber who did see the potential for machine learning and models at Uber across the company. And so you did have a lot of um, people who then did train models and then spent lots of time trying to get those models into production. And then they were struggling with getting production grade SLAs um, up and running where the model doesn't just crash and the latencies are good and all that stuff. And it was just a hodgepodge of different frameworks were being used. And it would take a very long time for data scientists to work with software engineers, with data engineers, with ML engineers to over weeks and months get a new ML model into production. And then of course, um, various different use cases at Uber could benefit from the exact same types of features. There's a lot of feature sharing that could happen between different models. And then you would see that those features are again implemented over and over again. It was very hard for other data scientists to identify and even know what features had other data scientists used before them. And then it would be almost impossible for them to even reuse them. And so it just became very clear that there is a lot of opportunity for ML. People are applying ML already. It's super expensive to do it. It's extremely error prone to do it. So let's build a standardized centralized platform that allows data scientists and engineers to get to the platform and train an ML model and get it in production completely end to end from selecting the raw data to selecting the features, doing some additional feature engineering, training the model, back testing the model and evaluating it, managing the model artifact, versioning it, deploying it, and serving it in production and then monitoring the predictions all end to end with one platform. Hmm. Yeah, and so talking about this idea of the feature stores or just this whole thing starting to realize, hey, this is gonna, this could be very costly. I wanna jump into, do feature stores enable this, the companies that are using them to save money on, in terms of like their machine learning teams? And if so, how, how does that work? Yeah, definitely. There are tons of different opportunities to save money. Um, one is um, that if you're able to just reuse an existing feature, you don't have to implement it again. So you're saving time having to re-implement the feature. Um, you don't have to wait until the feature is backfilled if you were to implement it from scratch. So you can just get started, use it right away. It's, it's out there in production. Um, you don't have to go through the pain of working with a data engineer or an ML engineer who then re-implements your entire feature engineering pipeline that you've, that you've created in like your Jupyter notebook, who has to then understand your code and make it production ready and re-implement it and then work closely with you to make sure that all of you, the assumptions that you've made, he or she then is able to also extract and properly implement in the production code. And so all this back and forth is saved because the data scientist can just click a button or run a command line and get the feature into production without having to go through these extremely friction probe processes. Then on top of that, a central feature store is also able to give you visibility that you've never had before, where you now actually know, hey, what's actually the cost, the literal cost of these features? Like how much am I spending every day on um, running those compute jobs? to turn my raw data into, into feature values. Is any model even consuming these features? Or am I just producing these feature values every day, every minute, and nobody's using them? It's a complete waste of, of, of time and of money. Oh, that's or crazy. if somebody's consuming them, if some models are consuming them, which ones are those? Which business use cases are they attached to? 
how much um, money is the company even making or how much goodwill, goodwill are they creating with those models and is it worth it uh, looking at the cost. So those are just some of the um, immediate and, and obvious cost saving opportunities that you get by having a feature store. That's perfect because one of my next questions was, you know, how is there a relationship between a feature store and technical debt? And that kind of makes sense. Like if you're just creating a bunch of features, but no model is actually using them, what is that for? And the other thing I was going to ask is about um, how this can enable, you know, accountability and traceability. So, yeah. so that's perfect. Uh, now, before we jump into what you're doing at Tecton, I wanted to ask one quick question about Uber because it's always been on my mind since I heard about it. How I've heard Uber is also utilizing Kubeflow. So how does Michelangelo and Kubeflow work together? Or is that something that was just like a something that they used to use or, or can you not talk about it? That's fine also. <laughs> So, um, I mean, the Kubeflow by itself is a collection of various different tools, right? And they make it very easy for you to um, spin up um, Jupyter Notebooks. They make it easy for you to train TensorFlow models in a distributed fashion or even on a single node. They make it easy to deploy your models using Selden and whatnot. Um, they have Kubeflow pipelines to run some data, data pipelines in, a, in an easier way. But at the end of the day, it's like an umbrella for many different tools that are all related to machine learning and that Kubeflow makes it easy for you to run on Kubernetes. Um, at Uber and with Michelangelo, we were actually not running on Kubernetes. Um, we did use a lot of these tools that are under the umbrella of Kubeflow, where we were using TensorFlow um, for training, we were using Jupyter Notebooks for interactive development, but it wasn't that we were using the Kubeflow project as is. We we're much more using the open source components under it and fitting them into the, the Uber stack. Okay, perfect. Yeah, because that was something that had been roaming around in my head since we had um, Josh Button on a while ago talking about Kubeflow 1.0. And he said, oh, yeah, Uber uses this. And I was wondering, like, how is that working with Michelangelo in whatever regards? But if it's just like, okay, just the modules of it, that completely makes sense. And so now let's talk about Tecton and what you're doing over there at Tecton AI. And what exactly are you building and how is it different from Michelangelo? Yeah, definitely. So Tecton is a data platform for machine learning. And you can really think about it as a first like enterprise ready feature store um, that takes the lessons that we've learned at Michelangelo, at Uber, and various of the other companies that you've named earlier to um, bring like really a best-in-class feature store to other companies who really want to use machine learning, want to use it efficiently, want to use it in production. Before I go into more of the specifics of Tecton and the capabilities of it, one big difference to Michelangelo that's very important is that Michelangelo was an end-to-end -end ML platform that helped you both with the modeling layer and with the data layer. And you, like you, machine learning consists of both. You need the model and you need the data. If you don't have one or the other, then you're not going to be able to get a model into production. And so Michelangelo handled both of them. The, it trained the model for you off of the data that it provided. It managed the model artifact, it deployed the model artifact, it serves the model artifact, and then as part of the serving, it was also serving the features, the data underneath. And so you can really look at it at this like two layer stack of data and models that have to be integrated with each other and they have to go hand in hand in order to be successful with machine learning. Was it, sorry to interrupt, was it also managing the data? Yes, and yes so it, was. it was. moving it around from databases and all of that good stuff too? So it was connected to the raw data sources. And so Michelangelo itself wasn't like providing a data warehouse or an OTP database. It was connected to those raw data sources in the company. But then the features and the, the feature transformations that do turn those raw data into features, that was stored and managed by Michelangelo. 
course, then using Flink for streaming aggregations, for streaming transformations, and Spark for the batch transformations. But it was always deriving features from the raw data and then storing and persisting them in data stores that Michelangelo itself managed and then used to serve those feature values. Perfect. Okay, so now jump into Tecton. Tecton focuses only on the data layer and provides very, very uh, like intuitive and first-class integrations with tools in the modeling layer. So we have no intention of um, providing right now like the modeling layer on top of our data layer. We're really focused on providing the best-in-class feature platform that allows you to curate, manage, and serve those feature values. Again, the, what, what does that mean again? Curation is you tell Tecton, these are my raw data sources. This is my S3 bucket, or this is my Kafka stream, this is my Kinesis stream, this is my uh, Snowflake or Redshift database. And so you configure Tecton to be able to access those, typically using IAM permissions if you're running on AWS. Then you also tell Tecton, what are the features that you want it to um, to run and how does it transform the raw data provided by these raw data sources into features that your ML models downstream will be able to train on and learn from. And the way you do that is by like we have this and we can go into more detail there later. We are big believers in DevOps. Of course, we're talking about ML ops here, DevOps for ML, DevOps for ML data and features. And so everything that you do with Tecton, all the configuration, Everything happens in a file system in Python files where you very declaratively lay out what are my features, what do the transformations look like, and then you hand those over to Tecton using a CLI so that Tecton is then able to automatically run these feature pipelines that turn your raw data into features that Tecton then stores in its feature store so that later on it can then serve those features to data scientists who are working in inter interactive environments in their Jupyter notebooks, to production training pipelines, and to production models who are either making um, high-scale, low-latency predictions in like handful of milliseconds or large-scale batch predictions. Perfect. So I know there has been quite a bit of hype around what you all are doing. And first of all, great job on that one. Uh, I think. Because it was, it's something that people really enjoy, like they need, and it's something that is right now really in the forefront of what people are looking for. I, I think it just came out at re the right time. And just recently, when was it, a week or two ago at Spark, you released more information about what you're doing. Can you talk to us about what, what exactly that is? And right now, like, because so everyone knows, if you just wanted to go out and buy Tecton, you couldn't, right? That's not possible yet. You'll, you'll uh, have to talk to us. And, um. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but we do have something special for everybody that is here today and in the community. I think we got to, we, correct me if I'm wrong on this one. I'm not going to just give out a lot of stuff <laughs> of Tecton for free, but, but I could. I, I've done it before. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Um, we said that if anyone wants to sign up for Tecton and you just put in the comments of when you're signing up for the waiting list, because I think you have a, a waiting list right now, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So if you put in the comments of the waiting list that you were part of the MLOps community or you saw this video or you listened to the podcast later on, whatever, um, you will get entered into a raffle for some gift cards. And I don't know what the gift cards are, but I got a feeling you're going to make it Uber Eats right now. I feel like <laughs> <laughs> you've been talking to us so much about Uber Eats. That could There's be a good gift way. card for uh, Tecton credits. Uh, there, we go. Between that. <laughs> there we go. That would probably be more useful than some Uber Eats. <laughs> so, so great. So just, yeah, talk to us a bit about that. Like if I wanted to go get Tecton right now, what's the process look like? Yeah, right now. Um, you basically reach out to us. It's very easy on our website. You just um, punch in your email address. You fill out like three optional forms on your use case. Are you running on the cloud or are you running on-prem? Because right now we're like a cloud-native um, feature platform. Um, very um, 
with a first class integration with AWS. So ideally you're running on AWS. If that's the case, then that's great. And then we'll reach out to you and discuss how to um, deploy Tekton into your environment. Um, the quick summary on this is Tekton basically supports a SaaS deployment version and a VPC deployment version. There are some customers who say, hey, my data is highly sensitive. Um, I really just want you to deploy the full Tekton stack into my environment. Typically, the way that would work is they have an AWS account. They create a cross um, account access role for us with limited permissions. That's enough for us to deploy Tekton into their environment. They get it up and running. That typically takes less than 24 hours. Or the alternative is where they say, no, just give me the full SaaS solution and I'll give your SaaS hosted version of Tekton access to my S3 buckets or to my Redshift, my Snowflake, my Kinesis, wherever it is. And then everything just runs in our AWS account. Cool. So you mentioned that it's, it's best if you're on AWS. Is there any other like prerequisites? Do I need to be running Kubernetes or is there something that specifically I need to be running to have it? As long as you're in AWS, we're, we'll be able to figure it out because um, we use all the base level infrastructure primitives from AWS. Like we use EKS as the Kubernetes hosting solution, Dynamo for a lot of the key value store and the low latency serving, S3 for um, the warehouse, MSK um, for as our Kafka provider and stuff like that. And so as long as you're running on AWS, it'll be very easy to get Tekton up and running. Perfect. So now what can you walk us through? Like what does the process of building a feature look like in Tekton? Mm -hmm. How does that work? Yeah, definitely. So you typically, so what's a feature? A feature consists of two things. One is the metadata. It's like just the envelope of the feature that describes, hey, what's the name of it? What's the entity that this feature is associated with? Say like a transaction or a rider or driver or a restaurant or a combination of those is also of course possible. Then who's the owner? Um, what's the SLA of it? Is it like an experimental feature or is it a production feature? What are the freshness guarantees of this feature? And all that type of stuff. And then besides that, that's because that's not enough. That's just, that would only give you like a, a catalog of information of metadata. That's nice to have, but that's not enough. Um, besides that, you also need to define, hey, where, how do, how do these feature values get calculated? And you describe a feature transformation that turns the raw data into the feature values. And we integrate with different data processing engines. We have the best integration right now with Spark. And so typically what you would do is like, you just define the feature transformation using PySpark code or Scala code if you prefer that. And you write that all in Python files that are again, um, describing in a declarative way the feature repository. And then you, once you're happy with your feature, then you run, then you use our CLI, then you run Tekton apply. For those of you who are familiar with Terraform, it's the exact same thing where you use our CLI to um, basically ship this feature repository configuration that you have locally that will be git back for full versioning or whatnot to Tekton's backend. And then Tekton tells you, oh, this is the delta, this is a difference that I'm noticing. You've created a new feature or you've deleted an old one, you've changed the configuration. Are you sure you want to, you want to do this? And then you say, yep, I'm sure. Or your CI/CD pipeline says, yep, I'm sure. And then Tekton actually starts spinning up and rolling out those data pipelines and then curates and processes these new feature values and makes them available in the feature store. Great. And then, and uh, how much automation is involved in this and where does that come in? Um, the automation that Tekton does for you behind the scenes or? Yeah, which... so a bit of, yeah, exactly. Like where's, where, is, where are things that I would generally have to manually do? Where is that being picked up from Tekton? Yeah. Okay. Where do I even begin here? There's so much you'd have to do manually. Um, there we go. Maybe we need a whole another session on that one. <laughs> but let me, I mean, I'll, 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 let, let me just, uh, I'll, I'll walk you through the life of a feature. Like let's say you've actually just created a snippet, which and like in these, in your feature repository, again, which like declaratively defines your entire feature repository, all the features, you just add a new, 
Um, you add a new couple of lines here, which is really just, oh, here's a new feature. This is my transformation. It's just some PySpark code. This is the name of it. Then you, if you're in a production environment, you would now typically just git committed into your git repository and your CI CD pipeline would talk to Tekton using Tekton's CLI, which rolls it out. Or if you're just experimenting, then you can on your laptop just use the CLI too. As soon as you do this, a whole bunch of stuff is happening at Tekton where Tekton looks at, hey, what's the state of the world right now? What's your new goal state? Like, okay, there's a new feature. Um, this is the raw data from which this feature wants to generate feature values. This is what the transformations look like. What's the, what's the revisioning that's necessary in order to run these transformations? What's the, um, like, what are the instance types for your Spark cluster, for your EMR cluster or your Databricks cluster in which you want to run it? Then it knows, okay, new feature. This is the, this is the um, provisioning I need for a new Spark cluster. This is the time range for which the customer or the user wants to backfill the feature value. And then Tecton would say, okay, let me first spin up um, a Spark job on, say, EMR or in Databricks. We support both of those which now takes a feature transformations, runs it as a Spark job to do a backfill over a historical time range that you've specified, which then writes those feature values into both Tekton's online feature store, Dynamo if you're running on AWS, S3 for the offline feature store. Then it knows, okay, now the backfill is completed. I know that going forward, the customer really needs high freshness for these feature values. How do I get the highest freshness feature values? Well, I do get them by connecting at the stream that um, this feature transformation wants to, wants to consume from. So it then spins up a structured streaming job, a Spark structured streaming job, which now continuously in steady state keeps transforming feature values and writes them into both the offline feature store and the online feature store. And then of course, all of that comes with monitoring where the system notices, oh, like a backfill job has failed, let me retry it, or let me see what's going on here, why did it fail? It also looks at the streaming jobs, ensures that they're running properly. It even looks at um, the, the freshness of those features that the, that the streaming jobs are producing. It continuously monitors them and then informs you as well as Tekton's on call in case something's going wrong. And that's just a, a like a, some sub subset of the stuff of the automation that's happening behind the scenes with Tekton if you create and onboard a new feature onto the platform. And so you can imagine it's a lot of stuff that you would typically have to do manually and that most companies are still doing manually today if you wanted to do this all by yourself without a platform. Completely. Super insightful. So is there a way to, when you're creating these features, is there a way to group them together? Yes, there is. Um, so there, one at the most fundamental physical level, um, there is the grouping where we, where you as a user group features into feature packages is what we call them. And typically a feature package uh, refers back to a feature transformation pipeline. Imagine just a PySpark job really. And this PySpark job can produce one or many features. Typically it's more efficient to compute many features at the exact same time. And so all of those features together are now grouped by default into one feature package. Now, feature packages can also be associated and should be associated typically with entities in your organization. Again, like that's, those are typically the core business objects, the business entities uh, that your organization revolves around. Customers, shoppers, transactions, products, that type of stuff. And then you're also able to group feature packages into feature families in case you want to um, have some additional partitioning on a per team basis or something like that. That's for instance, something that we had at Uber. Uber Eats? <laughs> is one of them. Fraud is another one. <laughs> so uh, now talk to me about like, is there some kind of, I, obviously there's an, uh, I would imagine there's uh, some kind of UI that Tekton has, or is it only just like, this library that you're declaring with? How does that work? And we do come with a, with a UI. There are the, the main interfaces that you're interacting with as a user is on the one side, the UI. It just makes it very easy to see what are all the features in my organization. 
that makes it easy to discover new ones, filter them by entity, by department, by feature family, full text search, and all the stuff that you'd imagine. Then there is a Python SDK that you use that you would use in your Jupyter notebook or your MR notebook or your Databricks notebook to um, fetch feature values, typically in order to generate your historical training data and whatnot, where you say, hey, Tecton, for this set of features, give me feature values over the last 365 days for these 200 business entities. And business entities will be uh, specific, say, writers or drivers, where you pass in their primary key into Tecton. And then Tecton just generates the data frame for you with all these historical feature values for all these entities over the entire time range that you specified. That's the Python SDK. And then there is the CLI. The CLI is what I mentioned now a few times in order to enable this full DevOps flow for features to tell Tecton, hey, here's the new goal state. Look at my feature repository configuration that I, as a customer, back myself in Git. Look at it and roll it out to production and tell me what the delta is. That's what you use the CLI for. And then last but not least, there, of course, um, we have APIs for the real-time serving of these features, um, like a gRPC and a, a REST interface. And we provide a client-side library right now for the JVM to communicate with these APIs. But you can, of course, integrate yourself as well with those APIs. Nice. So one thing that I, I talked with uh, Shuby Jane a while ago about their platform at SurveyMonkey when he was creating that feature store. And I asked him, so do you guys have like a, a leaderboard of feature, whose features been used the most and who created <laughs> it? How I'm wondering if you have anything like that. <laughs> well, it's funny that you say that. Uh, a little over a year ago, we built a mock version of this. It wasn't connected to any real data, but we just we just put it in the in the product as like an Easter egg that we could like show to people when we were demoing the product. Yeah. And so we do have that code in the code base uh, just to show what it could look like, um, but it's not actually connected yet. But if there is interest for something like that, it would be easy I, enough to to recycle that old UI. Yeah, I think I think it would be hilarious to have that because. It could breed a little friendly competition between teammates <laughs> for look at this feature that I created. It's been used over X amount of times. Yeah. And I'm also wondering about this monitoring. You were talking earlier about like how feature stores can save money when you're looking at if features are actually being used and if they're not, is that part of the monitoring that you were talking about? That is one part of it. Yeah. yeah, that's one part of it. It's just the visibility into the cost of features and then the ability to even identify which one of those features is actually used by a model. But there's additional monitoring, like data quality monitoring typically and data drift monitoring, where um, typically with machine learning, when things go wrong, it's not that the model breaks or that the microservice that hosts the model breaks. Like we've got that under control now, I think, with, mm. with the best software engineering practices, those are not the hard problems anymore. What tends to happen though when ML models break is that the data breaks. And that could mean um, one of many things. One thing that oftentimes happens is that an upstream data pipeline is just lagging or it's completely broken. And so no new data is coming in. What does that mean for the model? The model is now getting poor feature values. Either it's getting no feature values at all or it's getting completely wrong feature values where suddenly the standard deviation um, is 10x different to what you expect or the mean is shifted by a thousand or something like that. And that's something that we can detect and that we can alert on. Um, sometimes what actually is also the root cause is that there is no outage in an upstream data pipeline. The problem is much more that the world has just changed, feature distributions have changed, and all you need to now do is retrain your model. And it's actually really good to have this type of monitoring in place because you don't just want to retrain your model every night or every week if you don't get a, a, a performance boost out of it. You will only want to retrain your model when you know there is a reason for it. And that could be that your model performance is starting to drop or more interestingly, if you see that the feature distributions starting to change are starting to deviate from the distributions that you've identified when you first generated the training data set. That's like the, the goal state where you know what the distributions look like in a training data set that you trained your model on. And then in real time, you can compare those distributions to what you're seeing in production. And if there is a, a maintained 
deviation between those two, it's a good sign that you should probably retrain the model. Um, and then, yeah, the last thing is just the data quality monitoring that we're doing on the, the feature pipelines itself. It's more happening upstream when we run these batch and streaming pipelines where we look at the raw data coming out of the raw data sources. Does anything look off here? And typically what we try to do here is just provide you with a good, great expectations integration if you're familiar with those. So I want to leave a little bit of space in case anyone has any questions. Feel free to jump off of mute or throw it in the chat if you're a little shy. And because I know there's a lot that we've been going over. And so if anyone wants to ask Kevin anything, go ahead, jump in. Otherwise, I have a lightning round I wanted to get to on just to see what your initial responses and quick responses would be. But before we do that, I, I wanted to mention that it's super interesting how you were talking about this idea of just like, okay, the world may have changed. I know we, we used to say that at Dot Science a lot with like a computer vision model that is a car, a self-driving car. And there is, you know, like all of a sudden it snows. And this computer vision model is like, oh, is that a stop sign? I can't tell because it's under snow or there's snow on it. So that's, uh, that's huge. Now I see some questions here in the um, Q&A. Let me see here. So uh, Gonzalo's asking, seems that you're focusing on AWS. Did you choose AWS because you're experts in this cloud provider or are you involved at some level with them? Is there like a partnership going on? And that leads to the next question. Are you like, is there some kind of co-selling that's happening with AWS by targeting companies that are using SageMaker or how do you approach prospective customers? Yeah, definitely. So we are um, an AWS partner um, now. Most recently, we've got the we're, yeah, we're part of their official partnership program. Um, but we chose them mostly because that's just where most of our customers are on, and really that was just uh, market demand driven. Most folks today are still on AWS, and that's what we started with. But we built the platform in a way where it would be fairly easy for us to lift and shift to a different system. That's why everything is built on Kubernetes. Um, all the other AWS infra components that we're using, we typically decouple them and build against a generic interface. So that would be easy enough for us to switch over and support GCP as well. Like we wouldn't be able to support it tomorrow, but a couple of weeks of work and we'd be able to get it running on Azure or on GCP. If somebody comes to you and asks for it, you can make it work. Yeah, exactly. So the next question is from Alex Spanos, a, a, also a former guest on the meetup. And he's asking about feature. Well, first he's saying feature stores are awesome. Yes, they are. I agree with that, <laughs> Alex. And he was wondering by focusing solely on the data layer, is there a risk that companies will prefer solutions that are more end to end? Adding more complexity to the engineering infrastructure is not ideal for smaller companies. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think it depends on the type of company. There may be some companies who really just want to buy an end-to-end -end solution that does everything for you. And it, um, like, and the ML workflow consists of many, many different steps. Like, let's call it 10 different steps. And maybe you've got an uh, integrated end-to-end -end platform that implements from scratch tools that help you with every single one of these 10 steps. But by going so broad, you can imagine that um, the individual components are just 60, 70% good implementations of these systems because you're just spreading your focus. And so the end-to-end -end platform just cannot be as good. It cannot be as flexible as the alternative to this, which we oftentimes now see in companies where you've got centralized um, data science platform teams or organizations that um, provide a reference stack and an end-to-end and, and, and platform to the data science teams in the organization, or they just say, hey, this is the modeling tool you should use. Like always use PyTorch or use TensorFlow. Flow. This is the um, serving system that you should use, be it Selden. This is the feature store that you should use, ideally Tekton. And so they provide this opinionated framework to the rest of the organization 
and typically make it easy for them by integrating them with each other so that the data scientists, the engineers, don't have to think the whole time, okay, which component should I now be stitching together and be using a concert, but they just get this blueprint and this, this platform by the central organization, and they still get the benefit that on every single step of the ML workflow, they're able to use the best in breed class tool for that workflow step. And I believe that that's more where the future is heading with these ML platforms, or you will have these best in breed um, individual platforms that are really, really well integrated to give you a really amazing end-to-end -end experience rather than having these end-to-end -end platforms that implement everything from scratch, kind of reinvent the wheel to an extent, and thereby just give you a much less flexible um, platform and experience that always plays catch up with the latest things that are happening in industry. Yeah, it's that idea of, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah, exactly. And that, yeah, there's so many, so many interesting questions I want to ask right now for you. It seems like it's really getting good here now that we've got one minute left. <laughs> are you cool to stay five minutes over or do you have a hard stop right now? Give me one second. Uh, I can, I can run five minutes over. He can do it. All right. So Fabiana's asking in the chat, she's asking cheeky question. How does Tekton measure the cost of not having a feature store for a pers uh, prospective customer? Like, I guess this may or may not be something we need to ask sales team, but how do you map that out for someone? If you're saying, Hey, you guys need a feature store. It could save you X. Yeah, so when Tekton is running, it's fairly easy to measure the cost, right? Like we, at the end of the day, on AWS specifically, we run jobs on EMR, so we know exactly how much they cost, how many node hours are they consuming, what costs does that boil down to? And so you get extremely clear visibility into the costs of um, not just Tekton as the entire platform, but on an individual feature by feature level, you can see, okay, this feature cost me this much for the data processing. This feature cost me this, this and that much for fetching the feature value for training the data purposes, for training purposes, or this is how much it costs me for real time serving. And so you get a really good, um, clear picture of where does, where do the majority of the costs come from? If you want to predict it for a productive, uh, pr prospective customer, then um, the costs are a function of how much data are you processing? Like, is it how many rows basically are you processing in order to generate your feature values? How frequently do you need to reprocess these feature values? And then it gets a, and then how frequently are you consuming those feature values? There is an additional trickiness of like what's the cardinality of like your primary keys of individual features that's also is factors in there. But by looking at your existing um, data processing jobs or looking at the data um, shape, we can typically come up with fairly accurate estimates of how much this thing is going to cost you. So another idea on these being able to filter your features, can you filter it by the most expensive features? <laughs> Not today, but it, we do have that information. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking, you know, the, the people in the organizations who's saying like, oh yeah, I got the badge for most used feature. And then the other guys got the badge for most expensive feature. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so as far as the question goes about, so when you were talking about, all right, we see this happening where a lot of tools are going to start integrating really nicely with each other. How mm -hmm. do you bet, what horse do you bet on to integrate in Tekton? And what are you betting on right now? I guess, what do you integrate really nicely with as far as the rest of the spectrum? Yeah. So we have an extremely strong integration with Databricks. Um, we also have a very strong integration with um, AWS specifically on AWS with SageMaker, which with EMR and with just IAM for ACLs. Then we have um, Blueprint, not just not really integrations, it's more like here, this is a good stack and documentation on how do you best use um, Tekton with MLflow? How do you best use Tekton with Selden? Or how do you best use Tekton with Algorithmia? Hmm. Perfect. So right now it's that you're you're making the the bets on those guys and 
is it just because they were market leaders in a way or was there something else that made you want to yeah, we try to provide integrations with really the best in class tools of the other parts that cover the other parts of the ML workflow. And like, typically it's not a, an extremely complicated tight integration with these systems. It's really just being able to talk to each other's APIs at a fairly well-defined interface level. Hmm. And um, yeah, it's, it's typically not that hard to add an additional integration, but those are the core ones that we're coming out of the box with. Uh, but we definitely want to heavily invest in additional integrations with the ecosystem going forward. Perfect. All right. Lightning round. Two minutes. Here we go. We got it. So I just, you can give me a yes or no or one word answers. Feel free. Oh, there's one more question actually here on uh, whether th that there is a huge trend towards open oh, sourcing and improvising uh, enterprise level service. Do we have plans to open source Tekton? Um, so it's an ongoing conversation. We do want to figure out which pieces, what parts, um, does it make sense to open source? Uh, that's an ongoing conversation that we're having with customers where we want to understand, hey, which pieces will be helpful for us to open source? Typically, we want to open source things where the customer needs to build um, customizations or wants to build customizations on their own or build deeper integrations on their own. And it definitely will make sense for us to do something there. When, when the need arises. So it's um, not off the table, but there isn't a clear plan for it on the roadmap because it's an, um, it's an ongoing conversation. And then on enterprise level service, so Tecton is software as a service. Even if we deploy it into your VPC, into your account, we manage it, we upgrade it, we security patch it, we're on call if the thing breaks. And so it's the, the it's proper production SLAs, the way you'd expect it from any other SaaS service. Brilliant. Thank you for that. And thanks for the great questions, Gonzalo. So now, are we ready for a lightning round? <laughs> uh, just give me one word answers or quick, short, to the point. Kubeflow? In, uh, great. Yes, no, maybe so. <laughs> uh, lots of components. Airflow? Very widespread and great. Kubeflow and Airflow together. Confusing. <laughs> ML flow. Very good. ML drastically changing our life in the next five years. Absolutely. Coronavirus recession. I hope not. TensorFlow or PyTorch? PyTorch. Food you eat the night before one of your long ass endurance races. <laughs> Lots of pasta. <laughs> Good. ML monitoring best tool. Who still to be seen. Mm. Where to start learning ML ops? ML ops community. There we go. I like that answer. One thing that we should know about Germany, or I should know mainly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, be excited for next year's Oktoberfest. <laughs> Are you guys hiring at Tekton? We are indeed. Data engineers, ML engineers, data scientists. There we go. Sales engineers too. Sales engineers. So yeah. last one, your personal most used open source tool. Kubernetes. Mm. All right, that's it everybody and best place to reach out to you. I'm not going to say it's LinkedIn because I've had a LinkedIn request to connect with you for a few days now. It doesn't get through. I imagine you're very, very popular and I got lost in the sea of people that are trying to get you to outsource them some coding in India or in <laughs> Eastern Europe, wherever they're coming from. So are you on, you're on Twitter, right? Yeah. Or tell us, is there another way? Maybe we can get you into the MLOps community chat. Twitter works with Kevin M. Stumpf um, or just my email, kevin at tekton.ai. Perfect. And so for everybody that didn't hear it before, we are doing a giveaway for Tekton. We are giving away $50 or euros. I can't remember what we said. I'm in euros these days. I think it's $50 of Tekton credit. So if you go on to Tekton, do you have the link? Can you throw that in the chat? Somebody, maybe Kevin. 
Um, if you go to tecton.ai and you sign up for Tecton, you will get to get some, make sure to put that it's ML ops. You were part of the ML ops community. So they give you the special treatment and there it is. I think that's about hey, it. D, D, hey, D, yeah, yeah, D, quick, quick, yeah, quick notification. The gift card is actually going to be most likely an Amazon gift card, not, not Tecton credits. Oh, all right. There we go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Amazon works also. That's all good. I'm sure everyone is happy to get any kind of gift card. So thank you guys very much for doing this. This has been really enlightening as far as feature stores go. For me, I know I learned a ton. I imagine everyone else did. And Kevin, you've been an awesome guest. You were very, very kind to break it down real slow for me and make sure that I understood everything. So that's about it. I think we're good here. And please, um, yeah, please reach out to Kevin if you have any other questions or check out Tecton. And we will see you next week. We got two meetups next week. So enjoy. See you all later. Thank you. See y'all.